thank you very much everybody who has attended today um we are going to have a whist a relatively whistle stop tour through some key aspects of data protection claims uh both myself ian and annie um i, I know are seeing something of an explosion in this area of the law and the information commissioner's officer i checked today reported that between 2022 and 2023 the number of reported incidents to them increased by 33 percent so that gives you an idea of the direction of travel um what i would say however is at the same time at least in the county court uh, judges in my experience remain deeply unfamiliar with these cases um, and I recall an instance at court where I sit as a deputy district judge in which a GDPR claim was adjourned three times by three full DJs, each on quite spurious grounds, which seemed to be quite obviously because they didn't fancy it. And eventually when it came to me, even though it was only a small claim, it took a full day to hear. And I think that illustrates the fact that these claims, whilst they can be low value, do have complexities which it is necessary to understand and we'll do our best to walk you through some of those today. So I'm going to start uh, and uh, Annie can I have my first slide please? Thank you. Um, defendants in, in data protection GDPR claims have had real procedural success in confining the scope of the claims in, in three main ways in recent years. Um, the first, which is what I've described there as the kitchen sink phenomenon, is where the claimant complains about a single straightforward data breach. And the courts have strongly criticised the tendency to plead and rely upon multiple causes of action beyond simply a claim under the GDPR or the Data Protection Act 2018. And, and that is because, at least in respect of core data protection principles, other than the data security requirement, which can lead to liability where you've had a third party um, breach, for example, a hacking case, uh, in respect of the core principles that where the defendant itself has directly or through its employees unlawfully processed information, then in effect, the Data Protection Act and the GDPR give rise to a qualified strict liability under the statute. So there's just no need to embroider the claim with additional causes of action at common law which add nothing but unnecessary complexity. And, and defendants have had some success in, um, in, in resisting claims and certainly confining them on that basis. Um, misuse of private information is normally, uh, alongside breach of confidence, as you will know, is normally the cause of action that is tagged on to a GDPR claim. It's actually often included as a cause of action because it enables claimants to recover AT insurance premiums, which they ha um, uh, usually have to pay to protect themselves. And there is something of a question mark, as I understand it, as to whether such premiums are recoverable in data protection claims per se. And that's why, uh, at least on one level, they are added in. Um, the, the second area where defendants have had procedural success, and I'm just explaining this by way of background leading up to my primary topic it, um, it is that the courts have deprecated the use of high court proceedings to bring claims under the GDPR or for misuse of private information where by virtue of their relatively small size and simple complexity they could and should not just have been brought in the county court but also on the small claims track. Uh, I would also add this though that in increasingly and this is a point that's been raised by one of the questions which I'll deal with later we see a, a, an increasing number of claims where personal injury is included within the claim, and that will almost inevitably result in allocation to the fast track. However, um, the extension of the fixed fee regime to the fast track and obviously now the intermediate track means that in essence, uh, all UK data protection claims, um, unless there is uh, something about it which warrants uh, multi-track allocation, are going to be subject to fixed recoverable costs. And therefore there is an immediately something of a disconnect between the value of these claims and the costs that it might take to bring them to court and which will be recoverable. Um, the third area where defendants have had procedural success um, is the one that I want to focus on. And that is the 
a de minimis or threshold of seriousness. And Annie, could I have my next slide, please? Um, the, the sort of zenith uh, of the defendant's victory here came in a case called Rolf and was Bravizards in 2021. Um, very briefly, the defendant acted for a school in a fees dispute with the claimant. Uh, the defendant sent an email to a child's parents. It was simply a letter requesting payment of fees with a statement of account attached to it. Um, the sender of the email mistyped the email address and it was sent to the wrong person. That person responded very promptly, saying that they thought the email had been sent in error. Defendant asked them to delete it. They deleted it within a matter of hours. Uh, and that came before Master McLeod in the High Court. And uh, Master McLeod, you can see there, cited from uh, a decision of uh, the Court of Appeal um, uh, called Am Ambrosidu and Coward. And in the decision of Lord, Just uh, of Lord Justice Newberger, as he then was, um, he made it uh, very clear in that case, which was a misuse of private information case uh, and claim under the DPA 1998, that... Uh, there, there was a de minimis threshold, uh, and you can see from the words in bold that it seems to me that courts should, in the absence of special facts, generally expect people to adopt reasonably robust and realistic approach to living in the 21st um, century. Um, can I have my next slide, please, Annie? Now, in Rolf, the master picked up that uh, ball and ran with it. You can see the quote on the slide there that she didn't hold back in describing it as a plainly exaggerated claim for time spent dealing with the case, an inherently implausible suggestion that the minimal breach caused significant distress or worry or made them ill. Uh, and she held that no person of ordinary fortitude would reasonably suffer distress uh, claimed in those circumstances. And um, she went on to say, uh, in the modern world, it's not appropriate for a party to claim, especially in the High Court, for breaches of this sort, which are frankly trivial. Now, that approach of Master McLeod was followed in a number of other High Court decisions. Um, but the apparently clear direction of travel that was discernible from those decisions was brought to a juddering halt uh, by the CJEU, the Court of Justice for the European Union, in a what is known as the Austrian Post case, I won't attempt to pronounce the full uh, Austrian name, uh, decided in uh, in 2021. Uh, and Annie, can I have my next slide, please? What is interesting about this case is that, as, as in all CJEU cases, the advocate, advocate general gave his uh, opinion first. And he concluded that there should be a de minimis uh, threshold applied in GDPR claims. And that led to a sense of optimism amongst defendants in this country that the approach in domestic case law would be followed at a European um, level. And you can see his reasoning on the screen there, uh, drawing a distinction between trouble and inconvenience and real non-material damage for compensation. Um, however, uh, and can I have my next slide, please, Annie? In a relatively rare step, because the Court of Justice only departs from the Advocate General's cases, it is generally understood in about 20% of uh, the cases before it. So, in a relatively rare example, the Court of Justice. Uh, disagreed with the Advocate General. Um, their reasoning, uh, as is often the case, is a little bit convoluted, um, but it's really the second paragraph there uh, which makes the point that they were concerned that if a threshold of seriousness were imposed uh, in this sort of case, that would lead to inconsistency as between the different member states because they would be free to uh, determine exactly what seriousness meant in any given case, and that would undermine uh, the coherence of the rules established by the GDPR, which should be applied consistently as between EU member states. Now, that decision, actually, I said 2021, it was actually handed down on the 4th of May 23, forgive me, and the importance of that is it was after the 
UK left the European Union after Brexit. The result of that is that it is not a binding decision on uh, our domestic courts. They can have regard to it, but equally they are free to disregard it in their discretion. Um, the Austrian post case, however, is not necessarily the final answer. Um, Annie, can I have my next slide, please? We have a recent decision of uh, Mr Justice Nicklin in a case called Farley and Paymaster. Now, Farley and Paymaster is a case that Ian is going to speak to you about in some detail um, later, so I'm not going to go into the facts of it. But uh, you can see the full quotation from the screen there. Mr Justice Nicklin had heard full argument on the uh, um, de minimis point before him in the case. Ultimately, he um, ducked the issue by finding that it wasn't necessary for him to reach a concluded view on the issue in that case. But importantly, as you can see from the screen, what he did hold is that um, whether each claimant could surmount a threshold of seriousness is a factual question that, like the similar question that applies in misuse of private information claims, can only fairly be resolved at trial. And so my understanding, at least, of what he's saying there is that any argument going to threshold of seriousness or de minimis is not appropriate, in most cases anyway, as uh, a strikeout argument or a summary judgment argument, because it does require a full analysis of the facts. Now, I'm going to double qualify that, however. Farley and Paymaster was not a straightforward case. In the far more straightforward cases of the sort that I've described, such as the Rolf case, it might well be possible to take that argument uh, on a summary uh, basis. But uh, at least in more complicated cases, uh, it will not be. So the upshot of all of that is that defendants should not be afraid to continue to raise the point, notwithstanding the Austrian Post case, but it, because it doesn't resolve the issue and it's not binding. And equally, claimants should be ready to meet it, deploying the Austrian Post case as a, a, a decision of the European Court of Justice, which is uh, certainly influential, if not binding. But the point remains unresolved. Um, we had a question before the seminar, uh, and the question was, if no real harm is proven, can we settle for zero and thus avoid paying any claimant's costs? Um, really, uh, the answer to that depends upon, as I've indicated, whether English law has the de minimis threshold or not. Uh, because what does no real harm mean? I think it has to be recognised that because distress is specifically compensatable under GDPR claims, you don't have to prove a personal injury. Uh, by definition, many, if not most, but many data protection claims will not involve significant harm. Um, and it's only if that harm falls into the category of trivial that the de minimis argument is really going to become available, because distress by itself is, is rarely uh, significant compared to something like a personal injury. And yet it is plainly on any authority compensatable under the GDPR. Um, so I hope that goes some way to answering that question. My next topic, which is much shorter, and Annie, if I can have my slide, please, is the assessment of damages. And I just wanted to draw out five core points in data protection claims. The first is that even though claims for uh, misuse of private information were born out of Article 8 of the uh, European Convention of Human Rights, uh, the Court of Appeal has held in a case called Various Claimants and MGN that the measure of damage and the assessment of damage is more naturally a question for English law and it is unnecessarily and unhelpful to have regard to Strasbourg case law, so that's to say ECHR case law. And similarly, the CJEU in the Austrian Post case said that even though there was no de minimis threshold, the assessment of damages under the GDPR is entirely a matter for domestic law of the different member states. And so this is really a, a, an area where English law is going to have to develop its own set of rules and uh, 
uh, principles as to the amount that is appropriate to be awarded without reference to any awards that are made uh, either at the European Court of Human Rights or the Court of Justice. The second point is that information rights don't have a special protected status, which requires a higher award than other forms of damage. Uh, and again, in the various claimants and MGN case, what uh, Lady Justice Arden said is that damages in consequence of a breach of a person's private rights are not the same as vindicatory damages. Um, and damages are simply an award to compensate for the loss of or diminution of a right to control information and for the distress that could be felt as a result. So that there's no element of uh, treating them uh, as inherently aggravated or um, uh, vindicatory. They are simply compensatory damages. Point number three is that uh, the approach of the courts has been to make one award of general damages where there's been a breach of data protection rights, uh, irrespective of whether or not that breach may well, uh, there may well have been a, a parallel breach of multiple causes of action. In other words, it's not going to double up the damages just because the, the there have been a breach of uh, for, uh, the uh, misuse of private information uh, cause of action uh, alongside GDPR or DP, DPA claims. The fourth point is something that I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, it's that whilst it's possible to claim damages for mere loss of control in claims for misuse of private information, uh, that is not possible in a claim under the GDPR where, distra uh, where some uh, element of loss uh, consequential loss has to be proved, even if it's just distress. And so where the unlawful disclosure or, uh, of information was caused by a third party, such as a cyber attack case, the courts have made it clear that that cannot be a misuse of private information because misuse of private information actually requires some positive act by the defendant. And in that scenario, it will have been uh, an omission that led to the cyber attack, if anything. And therefore, that sort of claim can only be made under the GDPR. And in that sort of and a GDPR claim, there has to be actual distress or injury, not simply a, a, a loss of the information. Finally, um, the court, again, in the various claimants case, made it clear that decisions in other areas of the law, particularly personal injury, should operate as a sort of sanity check. And if a, a award looks out of line with personal injury claims, then it might have to be tempered. And what Lady Justice Arden said there is that if it were otherwise, um, then uh, uh, it would bring the law into disrepute and diminish public confidence in the impartiality of the legal system. Now, I just want to end before I hand over to, I think, Ian, with uh, the other question, one of the uh, other questions that was put before the seminar. And the question was this, what are the prospects and practicalities of raising limitation defences for the personal injury portion of a DPA claim where the data claim is still in time? Well, I'm, I, I assume that's a question by a, a, a defendant uh, lawyer, and I'm pleased to be able to report that there is a good prospect. And that is because of the specific wording of Section 11 of the Limitation Act. What Section 11 says is that this section applies to any action for damages for negligence, nuisance, or breach of duty, where damages claimed by the plaintiff for the negligent nuisance or breach of duty consist of or include damages in respect of personal injuries. And there is direct authority on this point called Azaz and Denton. So that's Azaz and Denton 2009 EWHC 1759, where the High Court held that if there is any personal injury claim included within a mixed claim, then the three year period applies to all aspects of the claim, not just to the personal injury part of the claim. So the answer to the question is that if you have a data protection claim where personal injury is included, then a three year limitation period applies. Um, I hope that was helpful and I'm going to hand over to Ian. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jack. Um, what I um, hope to do is have a very quick look at three um, relatively important cases. Certainly the first case um, I, th I think is very important. Um, all um, good defendant cases um, and it really gives a sense of I, I think the direction of travel and the way the courts are approaching um, these sorts of issues. So can we have the first slide please? Um, 
There we go. Farley, Jack's already mentioned it. Um, arises out of a relatively common um, set of circumstances in these sorts of cases, that being um, somebody sends a letter or an email to the wrong person. Um, now, in Farley, what we have is the defendant paymaster um, look after the pensions um, for Sussex Police. And they um, send out an annual pension statement. Um, but in, in this instance, they sent out um, 450 pension statements to the wrong address. So they were the former residential addresses of um, either serving or former police officers. Um, it gets to a hearing, I think, in February this year. And um, the claimants at that stage had come down on the valuation of the claims and say that each um, claim is worth about one thousand two hundred fifty to fifteen hundred pounds, based on the sending of these letters, which contain um, pensions data, um, names, addresses, things like that. Um, despite the relatively low level of the um, individual potential damages, the pre-action costs had already come to something like one point two million pounds, which um, the defendants rather um, um, took an intake of breath at. Um, and if we could go to the next slide. Um, at the hearing, it's known that some of the letters containing the pension statements actually found their way back um, or were redirected to the original um, intended recipients unopened. Some, as you'd expect, just went into the ether and were never seen again. And only in 14 cases was there some evidence that the letters had been opened by third parties. And in only two of those 14 cases, was there any evidence that the letters had been opened by someone who wasn't a family member or a colleague of the intended recipient? Um, so we've gone to the next slide. Um, and D, um, as you may expect, applied to strike out the claims. Um, and they say different things um, for the different causes of action. In, in relation to the data claims, they say there's just no award you can get for loss of control of the data, which Jack was just saying after Lloyd and Google. Um, and in, in very, many, very many of the cases, there was no pleaded case of any actual damage in respect of the MPI claims. Um, it's said by the defendant that there's just no misuse of the data capable of founding the claim. And rather assuming that there was a de minimis threshold, um, they say, well, look, even if, um, there is some sort of breach. Um, there's no, it, it, it wouldn't cross the de minimis threshold. And to really put the nail in the coffin and say, this is all Jamil abusive. Um, the light's not worth the candle. It's, it's an abusive process. It should all be struck out. So that's what the defendant says. And if we go on to the next slide, <clears throat> to delve into it a bit more, um, the defendant argues that in terms of the misuse of private information claim, um, that unless the statements had actually been read by a third party, there's no misuse. And then the fallback position, the secondary position, is that even if they have been read, that's not a misuse for the purposes of the tort. Next slide. Um, in respect of the secondary position, the court um, doesn't agree with the defendants. The view of the court, uh, Mr Justice Nicklin, is that assuming that the claimants can establish that there is some um, information within the letters and the statements to which an expectation of privacy um, would attach, then if the claimants can show that this information has been read by a third party, then arguably um, that is a misuse of private information. So the secondary case doesn't get the defendant very far. Um, but if we go on one, um, each of these claims of misuse of private information depends upon um, some the, the information going into the hands of a third party and then opening the letter and then the third party reading the contents. And for all the claimants, this is just inferential, says the court. And the next slide. So that's the MPI claims and the data claims. Um, similar sort of argument. Um, post Lloyd and Google, damage is limited to material damage and distress. So, as we know, loss of control is no longer recoverable for the data claims. Go on, Mon. And, and C says, well, the way around this is that, one, there's an inferential case that the misaddressed envelopes have been opened. So that's um, something that the court, the, the, the court can, um, a view can be taken at trial. Secondly, they say that 
even if they haven't been open, the, the Cranes all suffered some distress or a degree of distress caused by not knowing what had happened to the misaddressed letters. Um, and the next slide. Um, argument doesn't really um, get them anywhere. Um, in respect to both misuse of private information and data protection, um, it's necessary, the court says, for the claimant to show that there's a real prospect of demonstrating that the letter was opened and read by a third party. And without that, the relevant claimant would have no real prospect of demonstrating that there'd been a misuse of essential elements of the tort. So for the MPI claims, the claimant needs to demonstrate that somebody has actually read this information um, before it can be a misuse. And if we go on one, um, and, th and this idea that um, the claimants can advance a claim that uh, until the return of the information there was a risk um, doesn't get them anywhere anyway, uh, anyway, because the general rule of tort, you can see the quotation, does not generally allow recovery for the apprehension that a tort might have been committed. A person crossing the road cannot recover damage for almost being struck by a passing lorry. To be entitled to any remedy, a claimant must demonstrate that he or she is the victim of a torturous wrong the near miss, even if it causes significant distress, is not sufficient. So this idea that um, a near miss, the distress of think, worrying that um, your data or your information was at risk, um, isn't enough um, to satisfy the criteria for an MPI, or indeed, as we later find out, the data protection claims. And if we go on one, um, and then the court just says it, it is the same for the data protection as the MPI claim, Data breach cases or premise, the court says, on the personal data of the relevant claimant having been compromised, usually accessed by or provided to a third party, short of a claim for loss of control, and the claimant's case is essentially one of unlawful processing by sending the letters to the wrong address. Um, but if it's not opened or read by a third party, there's been no real processing. Um, it's near miss, and that's not enough for a data protection claim in these circumstances. So if we go on one more, please. Um, you, you get to the situation where the court seems to be saying that in these sorts of cases where letters are misaddressed or email sent, unless there is some sort of evidence or, or, or compelling argument why it can be said that the unintended recipient has actually read the information, that's not, um, according to Mr Justice Nicklin, um, a, 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 a processing for the purpose of the data protection or a misuse of private information for the purposes of an MPI claim. Um, that said, of the 14 cases where there was some evidence um, that the letters had at least been opened, um, those were allowed to proceed, um, but it was noted that there was still um, an evidential hurdle um, that someone actually had to read um, the letter, um, not just have the envelope opened, um, but that's a matter for um, trial, the court thought. And if we go on one more, please. Um, Jack's already mentioned um, the court um, ducked the issue of threshold of seriousness. Um, I suspect it's not going to be resolved within Farley, um, given um, where those 14 cases um, now stand. But um, at some point it needs to be addressed. But um, you've all heard what Jack said about that, and I don't disagree with anything he said whatsoever. Um, next slide. Uh, Jamil Abusive. Um, that argument rather than by the wayside now that um, the 450 claims were whittled down to 14. Um, there, there's an interesting discussion about what should happen to those 14 claims, um, either remit them to the county court and possibly the small claims track. Um, there is a suggestion within Farley that um, because the defendant was saying that they weren't a data controller, they were the data processor, that one thing that could be done is that the 14 cases stay in the high courts, have that determined as a preliminary issue. Um, but um, that's all the stuff for another day, and um, perhaps the parties will take stock um, now that they face a rather different set of claims than they had originally done. Um, so that's far the really important case, really interesting case, really helpful case for defendants. Um, moving on to another interesting case. There we go. There's the former president and possibly next president of the United, United States, um, Trump and Orbis. Um, Next slide, just wanted to show everybody Mr. Trump there. Um, this was all about the Steele dossier, um, 17 intelligence memoranda um, 
which were prepared by the defendant, Orbis Business Intelligence, and then uh, published by BuzzFeed. Um, this particular case was brought by um, Mr. Trump, former president, um, in respect to two of the mem memos. And he said that various allegations were inaccurate and that caused him lots of distress and upset. Um, next slide. But um, despite what was said, the defendant said there's no prospects of um, him obtaining any compensation for embarrassment or distress. Um, at the top, where, where we get to the decision and where we get to various parts of the decision, the only bit of the claim that um, survived various applications to strike out was a claim based on an allegation of unlawful retention and storage of the data. Um, now, the president, former president, um, witness name had identified that it was the publication of the data by BuzzFeed that caused the distress. So the next slide, please. And where that gets you from the defendant's perspective is an argument that, um, in essence, as we say, Lloyd and Google, compensation is only available for damage suffered. And insofar as the claimant suggested that he was entitled to nominal damages to vindicate his rights, well, those damages aren't available under legislation. And in response, the claimant says, next slide, Annie. Um, well, we've pleaded distress over the purpose of a strike and application. You've got to assume that um, distress has been caused. And they say, well, no, 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 no. Even if um, the claimant can't show um, distress or, or de minimis distress, and again, it's interesting that for the purposes of, of, of these proceedings, it was rather assumed that you needed to fight, you, then there was a threshold of distress. Um, it's said on behalf of Mr. Trump that he can still obtain nominal damages to vindicate mm -hmm. um, his data protection rights. And if we go on one, um, in terms of the decision, um, you see the quotation at 117. Um, and it really is um, a, a, to highlight, I think, the importance of pleading and to make sure that you're what you're saying is accurate when you come to explain what was distressing, because the court um, said, well, looking at the witness statement, looking at the pleadings, um, it's just not right that, um, or it can't sensibly claim that the distress was um, caused by the mere fact that the defendant had copies of the memoranda. And what was being said is that um, it was the publication of the memos which caused the distress, and in those circumstances, um, the claim just falls apart. Um, and the next slide. Um, nominal damages, this idea of nominal damages, um, it, it is inconsistent with Lloyd and Google, the court says. Um, uh, and you see the Supreme Court held that there's no entitlement to compensation under what was the 98 DPA based solely on proof of a non-trivial controversial requirements of that act in relation to any personal data. So going on, Ron, please. Um, it's just, you just don't find it in the statute, uh, an allowance for nominal damage. Um, and then the court says, the claimant's contention is that in respect of this statutory tort, he has a right to a remedy that is not in the legislation. And then we are right to nominal damages. That's the wrong approach. Parliament has created both the cause of action and identified the available remedies. It is not for the court to su um, supplement the statutory remedy of compensation with a non-statutory remedy of damages. And going on one, this idea that um, is canvassed by the claim that nominal damages are always available is just it's just out and out wrong. Um, nominal damages of a token sum are awarded or a tort is actionable per se. And the claimant is unable to prove any injury or loss. So nominal damages not available um, according to um, Trump and Orbis in this, it's only in data protection legislation. Um, and if we move on to the Final case. Um, there we go. There's Donald Trump. Thumbs up. No doubt a gesture he didn't make when he found out the decision of the court. But moving on from that wonderful picture, Riley. Um, in its way, an important case. Um, it's a Scottish case. Um, and it's the first case, and I, I think I'm right in saying this, I'll stand corrected, um, that deals with the legal proceedings exemption in the DPA, not the GDPR. What happened in this case, very briefly, is that Mr. Rowley used to work for the defendant organisation, 
the defendant was sued by somebody else, and in the course of those proceedings, the defendant disclosed um, various uh, bits of information about Mr. Riley. And Mr. Riley was referred to in the judgment, and a local paper picked up the case and referred to Mr. Riley a couple of times in an article. And Mr. Riley, either rightly or wrongly, wasn't terribly happy about this and sues his former employer. And what Mr. Riley says is, well, you've breached um, two of my GDPR rights, Article 51A, which requires lawful, fair and transparent processing, and 51B, um, which requires that data shouldn't be processed or data, should, data, data needs to be collected for specified, explicit and legitimate purposes and not further processed. So that's my, they're my causes of action, says Mr. Riley. And if we go on one, um, as um, many of you will appreciate when you dive into the schedules of the DPA 2018, which is not something I particularly recommend, um, but Schedule 2, Part 1, Paragraph 5, 3, um, gives an exemption for legal proceedings. So um, various articles of the GDPR don't apply um, if it's otherwise necessary for the purposes of establishing, exercise or defending legal rights to the extent that the application of those provisions would prevent the control from making the disclosure. So, so that's known as the legal proceedings exemption. And if we go to the next slide, um, what the claimant argues is that um, the effect of that exemption means that the data controller had to attempt to apply the provisions of the GDPR, um, so um, fair lawful processing and so forth, before they seek to apply the exemption. So you've got there's a stage that needs to be gone through. Um, but the defendant says, no, 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 that's completely back from the data controller exemption, um, exempt, the data controller is exempted, sorry, um, from even attempting to apply the listed GDPR provisions. And if we go on, the court says the defendant's right. Um, a policy's duties as a data controller, controller can't, be, can't fetter its discretion to conduct litigation. Um, it's um, got a, a right to a fair trial, can't be fettered. Um, the appropriate procedural mechanism, the court says, um, is for the, you know, the, lies in the court's discretion um, to anonymise judgments if appropriate. And over the page again, or on the next slide. Um, sh the Schedule 2 exemption exempts the data control from complying with Article 5.1, and that interpretation is consistent with the purpose of the exemption, um, the idea being that... Um, it ensures a litigant's duties um, as a data controller will not, be, will not impinge on their right to a fair trial. Um, and, and these issues do come up every so often, which is why you see um, very often heavily redacted um, documents um, in trial bundles. Um, but there is at least some authority now that the legal proceedings of that exemption um, takes out um, large swathes of the applicability of the GDPR. Um, interesting case, um, useful case, three defendant cases, um, all very helpful, certainly far very helpful in a lot of cases you see of um, low value mistakes. Um, interesting case about nominal damages um, authority for the proposition that they're not um, recoverable under data protection legislation, and then some guidance on how um, the exemptions in the schedules for the DPA will work. Um, so there's three quick cases. And now I think Annie is going to tell you something even more interesting than I've just done. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Um, so what I'll be dealing with today is the retention of a data subject's personal data, which is fertile ground of litigation. It crops up in matters as diverse as claims against employers, police forces, healthcare services, and educational institutions. Now, in the next 15 to 20 minutes, I'll set out the principles in relation to the GDPR and the European Convention on Human Rights. So, turning first to the GB GDPR, the key provision is Article 51E. I won't read it out, but this is what's known as the storage limitation principle. It applies to all personal data, and as a core principle. And what is particularly key is that a data controller or processor 
must prove that the storage of any, uh, any other personal data is necessary, which is what I've underlined, for the purpose for which the personal data area is processed. Now, this is quite a high bar. Indeed, in the recent non-binding CJU case of Digi, it was affirmed that the principle of storage limitation applied to restrict the storage of personal data used for other purposes. So how does one evaluate whether uh, the principle of storage limitation has been complied with? Well, in practice, context is everything. Now let's take a hypothetical example of a pub and a bank. Uh, both the pub and the bank have a CCTV footage, which records footage and therefore would constitute uh, the processing of personal data. Now, the object of processing in both cases is to prevent and detect crime. However, in light of the storage limitation principle, the length of time of each controller is allowed to retain that footage is likely to be different. So take, for example, the storage of CCTV in a pub. It's likely to be for a relatively short period until the police come along. And that's because any crime committed in a pub is likely to become apparent very soon. It's likely to be either burglary or arson, for example, or drunken disorderly behavior. And so a pub is likely to struggle to persuade a court that they need to keep the CCTV footage for an indefinite period of time. I think the usual period is about 30, um, 30 days. However, storage of CCTV footage for a bank is, likely, is more likely to be necessary to be stored for a substantial period of time. And the reason for this is that the nature of crime prevention in a bank renders it important that fo the footage is kept for a period of time. It's because, for example, the deceit resulting from a fraudster posing as a customer may not come to light until many months or years afterwards when the customer reviews or gets their bank statement. So when thinking about storage limitation and how um, the retention of data, it's worth considering when you get a case that lands on your desk, the following questions. First, identify the purpose for which your client has originally collected the data. And you can keep it so as, as long as one of those purposes still applies. Those, that purpose shouldn't be speculative. It should be the purpose that you originally collected that data for. Second, think about whether you need to keep it once a relationship ends. And finally, consider whether you need to keep that information to defend against future claims. And in that regard, it's worth considering the limitation periods in that respect. However, not all personal data is created equally. Article 9 of the GDPR provides that personal data in these categories are special category data. They are a class above given their sensitive nature. And practitioners sometimes forget how broad it is. It covers everything from data concerning a subject's health, to sex life, to sexual orientation. And if you want to process the personal data, you have to satisfy one of the conditions in the next slide. Now, the way you go about this is quite complicated. I'm not gonna go through every single one of them, but I'm going to take a problem question as an example. So let's say uh, you're acting for a care home which provides personal care for its residents. Uh, we know that health information, const um, they need to store their health information as part of that poor processing. And so they come to you for advice or a claim is brought in relation to their compliance with the GDPR in relation to storage of that data. First thing you look at is that the storage of personal data amounts to processing. So it was caught by the GDPR. And given that you're dealing with the health information of the residents, that amounts to special category data. So if you go to Article 92H, um, this mirrors the storage limitation principle I mentioned earlier. Article 92H, if I go back, concerns health or social care. And that seems the most obvious uh, measure under for processing under this pro, under this principle. If you look at the slide, what it indicates is that the provision of health and social care is one of the reasons 
that you can give for processing, uh, for necessary processing. But of course, the analysis doesn't end there. It's subject to another provision, Article 9.3. Now, this is quite, it's, it's, a, it's a remnant, essentially, of the European origins of the GDPR. And it's not quite clear exactly what it says at first glance, but essentially what it says is that the data must be processed by or under the responsibility of a professional subject to obligations of confidence within the law of the relevant member state. Now, how you work out what the law of, the re of what English law then re replicates is to cross-reference the GDPR with the relevant provision in the domestic statute. So therefore, you have to leave aside the GDPR and then go to the Data Protection Act 2018. And Section 11 essentially puts the meat on the bones in this respect. It says that for the purpose of Article 92H, um, if you're in the UK, uh, then a professional subject to obligations of confidence includes the following. It includes a healthcare professional, a social care professional, or someone who in other circumstances owes a duty of confidentiality. But that then begs the question, what is a healthcare worker, healthcare professional? And for that, you have to go all the way to section 204 of the Data Protection Act, and look at the interpretation provisions. I haven't set it out in full because there are a number of different professions which come under healthcare professional, but essentially you need, to, in order to prove that you are a healthcare professional, you need to look at this statutory provision. And eventually you'll find what there's a list of what constitutes a healthcare professional and a social care professional. So after that quite sort of long-winded tour, the answer really is, Yes, so long as the data is processed or is subject to the, subjected to the responsibility of someone who falls within one of the categories in Section 204 of the 2018 Act, or is subject to a duty of confidence under any enactment or law. Moving on now to the ECHR, the critical provision is Article 8 of the ECHR, the right to privacy. Now, the ECHR is likely to be more used in these sorts of cases simply because you don't really run you're unlikely to if you're acting for a claimant you're unlikely to run into any limitation issues because if a party has stored the data then that breach as you say it is likely to go on be ongoing now this right is a qualified right and it's subject to interference the well-established test for assessing interference is that set out in bank malat for assessing proportionality. I note here that in matters concerning the retention of data, it's very likely that the first two criteria will be filled. It's the latter two which really strike at the heart of whether a public authority has undertaken a proportionate measure in retaining that data. Now, most of the case law in this field concerns the retention of criminal records or criminal allegations by the police. This was described by Lord Justice Beetson as a particularly sensitive and difficult exercise because the police in recording that data essentially have to deal with a number of competing issues. In most, if not all cases, it's very likely, it's almost certain that they'll be found to be an interference with Article 8 of the ECHR. Uh, the authority for that is CAT and Chief Police Officers, where Lord Sumption remarked, that even the collection and storage of public information amounted to an interference with private life. Um, to give some context to this, uh, CAT concerned the retention of records of participation in political demonstrations by essentially Mr. CAT in demonstrations going back to 2005. Um, they lost in all of the domestic courts, but ended up succeeding against the United Kingdom in the European Court of Human Rights on the basis that the political data was politically sensitive and there was no pressing need to store the data beyond the six years. Now, the jurisprudence on this point really concerns different applications of what constitutes a proportionate measure. Each exercise is fact specific. And so I won't go through each and every single one, but there are a few points which are worth considering. First, 
Uh, the length of the period is especially important, albeit not decisive, when considering proportionality. For example, in S and UK, uh, this concerns the indefinite storage of fingerprints and DNA data on individuals who are suspected of an offence, but which ended with discontinuance and acquittal. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights found a violation taking account in particular of the indefinite nature of the storage. But of course, in many cases, it will be proportionate to retain crime reports of offences for long periods of time, in particular, where those offences raise public protection issues. And this is because, in general, the interference with the subject's Article 8 rights is likely to be modest, whereas there is likely to be a compelling public interest in retention. And a prime example of this is the judicial review of CL and Chief Constable of Greater Manchester Police. Uh, this concerned essentially uh, the retention of crime reports, criminal reports, relating to the expersion, exchange and dispersion of sexual images of um, underage girls. Uh, it also involved allegations of coercion. Now, the storage of this data was challenged principally and largely on the fact that the claimant at this point was a child. However, the court identified a number of factors which militated in favour of the defendant. First, the fact that the, the reports had identified multiple incidents of alleged criminal behaviour. And this fed into the need to identify patterns of behaviour which would assist in the future investigation, prevention and detection of crime. Moreover, while of course there was a need to act in the best interest of the claimant, there's also a need to balance that in relation to the best interests of the other young people whom he surrounded and the other young people who he's alleged to have abused. Now, one point which does run through the judgments as well is the importance of compliance with authorised professional practice by the College of Policing. Now, this authorised professional practice includes, for example, trigger reviews every 10 years to review records, and it forms part of the legal framework that was discussed in CAT. Compliance with the authorised professional practice can really substantially fortify a chief constable's claim that their policy is proportionate. Alternatively, non-compliance with the authorised professional practice is likely to undermine any such claim. So a prime example of this is the recent judgment of AB and Chief Constable of British Transport Police. Um, this was a claim brought against the, uh, the police in relation to a recorded allegation of sexual assault, but one which was later found not to be correct because it transpired that it arose out of, um, it, there was a misunderstanding as to the nature of a disability and whether the allegation could continue to be retained. And this is particularly in circumstances when allegations under the Sexual Offences Act are normally kept until the alleged offender reaches the age of 100. Um, the trial judge essentially found that it was disproportionate, and Mr Justice Johnson uh, didn't interfere with the proportionality analysis. But he did note, in passing and in particular, that there had been systemic failures of the police authority in failing to conduct those 10-year reviews of the data. And he also said, importantly, the mere fact that there's been a lack of resources was insufficient. And that's what really tipped the trial judge and what uh, came within the reasonable bounds of Mr Justice Johnson's discretion into finding that it was disproportionate and the claimant had a claim under the ECHR. So ultimately, if you're acting for the police, the critical point for any proportionality assessment is evidence. Now, reliance on guidance from the College of Policing is important to build up that evidence base, as well as other policy documents. It's significantly likely if that's if you complied with the policy and were able to deal with it in that sense, that a challenge would fail. And that essentially concludes this presentation. We've got a few minutes left, and I appreciate there's some questions. I don't know if they've been answered or not. Um, hi, it's Jack speaking again here. I've answered one of the questions uh, in writing in the question box. and I don't know whether the questioner has seen my answer. 
just very briefly for the sake of everybody else, the question was, is distress classified as personal injury for the purposes of limitation or would a six year limitation period apply? My response is, no, distress isn't a personal injury. Uh, it, this is, uh, it will be determining that same way as a tortious claim at common law, there has to be a recognizable or diagnosable psychiatric injury for it to be a personal injury. And I've noted that the slightly ironic result is that if a claim is only for distress uh, and not supported by a medical report, then a limitation period is going to be six years. But for the reasons I stated earlier, if you include a personal injury claim, the period becomes three years, but is subject to the Section 33 uh, discretion to extend. There have been two other questions asked, which, Annie, I think related to your talks, um, your talk, forgive me. Yeah. I don't know if you can see them in the box. And when... Yes, yeah, so I'll just look at, I think the first one is about the Riley case, uh, which I think Ian is probably best, uh, best dealt with. Um, the second one, if an individual responds to an online review about their services, which contains comments made by the claimant at the time, is this likely to constitute a data protection breach? Um, I'm not. I'm not sure who's the, meant to be the who's the claimant in this context. If the claimant, if the claimant uh, responds to an online review about the services. I think, um, unfortunately, I think if you, uh, the, I don't think I'm able to answer that at the moment. I think I, I, I recall, for example, I don't want to start guessing or speculating. Um, there may be uh, a useful parallel with uh, defamation case law in respect of online reviews and what you can and can't say in that respect. But again, I don't have that off the top of my head and I don't want to speculate. But I think the defamation case law would, I think, be a really good starting point in assessing assessing that along with further information as to the nature of the comment and the precise allegations made. Um, Ian, in relation to Dunn and Durham, I don't know if you've had the opportunity to look at that in relation I, to I, the DPA. Just had a quick look at it. Um, from memory, um, Dunn and Durham was a case um, under the 98 um, Data Protection Act. Um, I don't recall um, there being discussion about um, the legal proceedings exemption or the form of the legal proceedings exemption which occurred in the DPA in that case. I, 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 I short answer is I, I can't, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but um, I don't think there was specific discussion about the legal proceedings exemption in Dun Dun and Durham, but I would need to have a look is the um, short and somewhat inadequate answer. Um, and unless anyone's got any um, better recollection of Dan Durham, I will um, leave it there, I think. No, thank you. Thanks, Annie. Yeah, I'm just, just, just adding to um, Annie's answer on the first question. Um, as I understand it, the question is whether or not where someone responds to an online, online review and in doing so includes information given to him by someone who becomes the claimant is added data protection breach. Um, it, applying misuse of private information, it would depend upon whether the information was given to the person replying to the review, the defendant, in circumstances where the claimant had a reasonable expectation that it would be kept private. And obviously, that's going to depend upon the individual facts of the case. Um, so I, I think that deals as best we can with those questions. Are there any other questions that anybody would like to answer before we bring the seminar to an end? If there are, please um, put your hand up or or type them in now. And if, if, you, if there's anything else, then um, please do not hesitate to contact uh, all or any of mm. us on our email addresses. I don't think we have any more questions. Oh, go on. That's very excellent. Thank you. <laughs> very kind, anonymous. That's a very question. That's very kind of you. Thank you very much. So I think we'll we'll wrap it up there. Can I thank you all again for attending? I hope it was useful. Um, and um, this is obviously a, a developing area of the law. Uh, I suspect this will be won't be the last time we're doing a seminar on this issue. Perhaps this time next year we'll have a further um, uh, go at and see where the, the law is at that point. But thank you all again for coming. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.